Come on, into the paddock. Stay away from the bees. And that's kind of when all hell broke loose and just ran right through the fence. I mean, they blew past it like it didn't even exist. Come on, let's go. Come on, come on cattle, let's go. You know, I'm a guy who has wanted a good many things. I wanted to move up to Vermont. I wanted to start a farm and I wanted to raise cattle. But I guess that's the thing about wanting, right? You know, there's this fake story about Buddha where Buddha meets this guy and the guy says to him, Buddha, I want happiness. How do I achieve it? And then Buddha says to the man, first you remove I, because that's removing ego. Then you remove want, because that's desire. And if you do those things, all you're left with is happiness. Now, like I said, that's a fake story, but I believe it speaks volumes to my current predicament. When I moved up to the farm full time in 2018, the first animal that we added to the farm was a barn cat, Pablo barn cat. But then soon thereafter, we added about 40 ducks to the farm. My plan was to start raising ducks because number one, it seemed like it could potentially be a good enterprise for our farm. And then number two, poultry is the gateway drug to raising larger livestock. As a kid, I grew up in the suburbs and I never really had anything other than a dog and cat around the house. And then as an adult, I spent most of my time living in large East Coast cities. So despite the fact that I wanted to start a farm, I was severely lacking in agricultural experience. And so by adding ducks and then geese and eventually chickens, that gave me some real experience with working with animals and understanding what needs to be done with those animals. And my plan was eventually I would always upgrade to larger grazing animals, whether that be goats or sheep or cattle. But to be honest with you guys, it was always gonna be cattle because I've always been fascinated with cattle. Their big, massive lumbering size, the way that they can consume so much grass and the way that they take that grass and convert it into energy and ultimately growth and ultimately they can be turned into a product that can be consumed by humans or other animals. That whole process to me is absolutely amazing. And when I first started down the path of regenerative agriculture and started learning about guys like Greg Judy and Joel Salatin and Alan Savory, they were always telling stories about those big lumbering ruminants and what they can do for the land. And so way back when, when we first purchased our farm and I had visions of grandeur of what this place would ultimately become, those large open pastures that we had at the farm were always gonna be there for the grazing animals. But I knew I needed to learn. And so over the past three years, I've been working with my birds and learning how to raise animals. I've also been farm sitting for friends and learning how to work with other animals like sheep and cattle and pigs. And all of that experience got me to a place where I thought I was gonna be ready to have cattle on the farm. So as I was making my farm plans for 2021, I decided that this fall I was gonna add cattle, not a ton, Somewhere in the neighborhood of like four to eight was always the number I had in the back of my head. I knew I wanted a small breed of cattle, whether it be a Dexter or a Scottish Highlander. And so I set out to make preparations. I started searching for the livestock to buy. I started clearing out my barn so that I could make it a winter housing area for the cattle. I stockpiled hay as well as equipment necessary for raising cattle so that I'd be able to feed them and tend to them in the fall and the winter. And as I mentioned to you guys in a recent video, I ultimately identified a herd of Scottish Highland cattle and put out an offer to the owner. And I'm pleased to say that the owner accepted the offer and the cattle are officially mine. Cash changed hands, a bill of sale was exchanged, and just the other day I showed up in this farm out in Western Vermont to pick up the cattle. Now, I've, I've bought and sold a lot of poultry over the last few years. It's relatively easy, it's relatively straightforward. I feel like I've gotten pretty good at handling the animals and moving them and giving them to new people as well as taking animals from new people and bringing them here to my farm. But cattle are an entirely different ball game. I mean, a couple of 15 or 20 pound geese are relatively easy and straightforward to transfer. A 700 pound Scottish Highlander is a whole different story. And now this farm that I was buying the cattle from had some characteristics that I was most definitely looking for. They did everything all organic. Their animals were 100% grass raised, meaning they didn't use grain or corn or anything. The cattle's diet always consisted of grass and or hay. And they were nice, healthy Scottish Highlander animals. But now the downside with the farm and the cattle was 
these cattle weren't moved every single day and so they're not heavily handled cattle. So my plan here is ultimately to do a heavy intensive rotational grazing system on the farm where I'm moving the cattle at least once a day and I'm working very closely with them so they've become very familiar with me. That was not the type of cow that I was buying here. These cattle were uh, kind of like free range cattle. They uh, were able to kind of keep to their own system and schedule. John the farmer would bring them hay but it wasn't like he was moving them from pasture to pasture on a daily basis. And so they were a wee bit wild. That wildness definitely reared their head as we were trying to load the animals up into the livestock trailer. And I remember being out there working with the guys to get the cattle loaded thinking, my goodness, what have I gotten myself into? But ultimately we got the cattle loaded up and Don, who is the guy here from Peachum, who I hired to trailer the animals and bring them here to the farm, took them on the two hour trip to bring them here to Goldshaw Farm. Now the trip from South Hero to Peachum was pretty uneventful. According to Don, there were no issues, no escapees, no freakouts inside the trailer. So that was definitely a good sign. And once Don arrived here on the farm, he was able to back his trailer right up to that gate that's right there behind me. And he settled the back of the trailer up right against it. And I had built a little bit of a corral around the area. You know, because these cattle weren't used to regular rotation and they weren't regularly being moved with a single strand of poly wire, which is ultimately how I wanted to keep them, I knew I had to have a little bit of a corral system and a training area where I would keep them for a week or two just to get them acclimated to the farm and the setting and ultimately to learn to respect that hot wire fence. You know, I've had an electric fence going around the perimeter of my permaculture orchard and duck and goose area for the last year. And the top wire fence always had a, a hot fence that was I think about 8,500 volts is usually what it was putting out at in max. And I can most definitely testify to the fact that if you hit that thing, you would most definitely feel it. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, that's one way to wake up in the morning. Ugh. But because I was adding these Scottish Highlander cattle, I think I needed a little bit more juice. Hello, I'm Kevin Marquin, key account manager here at Gallagher's. <laughs> and I've got an exciting Energizer to show you today. This is arguably the big bock V8 of the Energizer range. If you guys aren't familiar with Gallagher, they're, they're a great company. They are the manufacturer um, as well as distributor for a lot of rotational grazing resources as well as other animal support resources, waterers, heaters, etc. And the good folks at Gallagher actually sent me a whole care package. They sent me fencing reels, they sent me smart fences, they sent me poly wire and poly rope, and I also ended up getting a charger from Gallagher that puts out a lot more juice that's specially built for cattle and has a pretty far range in terms of how far it can be used, in terms of how many miles of fencing it can be stretched across. This is really important because if I don't train my cattle properly to the fence and they don't learn to fear and respect that hot wire, they could easily run loose all across this entire farm. Now the biggest risk factor I had too that I was also worried about a little bit was as I was untrailering the cattle, the corral I had built had to have a temporary access where the beehive was unprotected by poly wire. So I did have a nervous vision of potentially the cattle knocking over the beehive and killing the hives and bees everywhere and just cattle getting stung and chaos everywhere. Luckily for me, that did not happen and everything went very smoothly and the cattle went right into their corral. The cattle were a little bit bugged out by the new scenery, so they were definitely nervous and shy of people. I think there was a bit of stress and trauma for them in that whole process of getting them loaded into the trailer and having them brought all the way over here. But I always knew that that was the case and so I was gonna give them the time to be acclimated. Come on, bud. Let's introduce you to the new ones. Toby, hey, Toby, Toby, stay with me. They're okay, they're our friends. Just remember that, don't scare them. I sat out here in the pasture for, gosh, I don't know, maybe about an hour or so, just watching them and observing them and marveling at them. I mean, like I said at the beginning of this video, I have wanted cattle here on our farm for a very, very long time. But after an hour, I was like, okay, I don't think they're going anywhere. And so I went inside to have myself a little bit of a late lunch. 
and they did a little bit of work inside and then ultimately came back out to check on them again, I don't know, about two hours later. And that's kind of when all hell broke loose. You see, when I came back outside to the pasture, I came in through that gate, I opened the gate, and then I slammed the gate shut just like I always do. But then the slamming of that gate spooked the cattle and they saw me and then they immediately went on alert and just ran right through the fence. I mean, they blew past it like it didn't even exist and they sprinted up the hill and into the permaculture orchard. Now, I had known that the idea that the Scottish Highlander cattle who were not used to the poly wire would potentially jump over it or jump through it. That had always been a risk I was aware of. And that's why I made the decision that for the first couple months that I have the cattle, I was gonna raise them here inside the permaculture orchard. Again, this is almost 10 acres that are fenced in while it houses the ducks and geese and chickens and Toby dog. It also has plenty of unused space around the area as well. And I have this five foot welded wire fence along with the electrical top wire. And so if the cattle were to get out through that poly wire, I would at least have them contained somewhere and they wouldn't be loose and running wild. You know, a little while back, my buddy Tom, who also has Scottish Highlander cattle, one of his cows got loose and he was unable to recover it for like, I don't know, I think it was about a month that it was running free. And so the idea of my cattle running loose around Peachum, ugh, <laughs> that was a little bit scary for me. And so that's why I was taking the precaution of having them inside the permaculture orchard as I was doing the training with them with the poly rope. Next spring, I have a project where I wanna get the entire pasture fenced in. That perimeter fence is gonna be really important because when the cows are up on the top of the pasture next year, I wanna make sure if anything ever happens, like they get spooked by a coyote or something, they might run out of their poly wire, but they won't run out of the main fence. That's something that my cattle guru, Greg Judy, has always stressed to me, and so I've taken it very seriously. But while I was not at risk of the cattle creating any issues for the surrounding area, having the cattle running free in the permaculture orchard does create a risk for me. Because back in 2017, I planted about 600 trees, and so over the last four plus years, I've been maintaining those trees, replanting ones that have died, letting them grow. Some of those trees are up over 10 feet right now, but they wouldn't be protected from the aggressive browsing and grazing of a Scottish Highlander. And so that's when I started to do my first corralling of the animals. I first started out on foot and tried to do my best to persuade them to go back into their paddock. I then took additional poly wire and poly wire reel and rolled it all the way up to the top. Using that special reel from Gallagher, I was actually able to herd them in and corral them in. Come on, let's go. Come on, come on, let's go. That was not giving them access to the trees, but would give them plenty of access to roam still and learn the poly wire. And so I went to bed that night thinking that everything was A-OK. -okay. But when I came out here, to check on the cattle again yesterday morning. They had broken loose again. And talking to some of my friends who do rotational grazing, they said that the first mistake I was probably making was I was only using a single strand of poly wire. Now just to show you guys what I mean in terms of the difference. So right here, this, this stuff, you see it? This is the poly wire. So I think Gallagher calls it the turbo braid. So it's a little bit thicker than traditional poly wire but it's, you know, not super, super thick. This stuff is the poly rope, and so this stuff is much thicker. So here's your comparison, right? The advantage of the thin stuff over the thick stuff is that I can put more of it on a single fencing reel and really stretch it out for a good long while. The downside is it's a lot less burly, and I don't know if you can quite see this on the camera, but there's fewer of these like metal filaments that are running through it. And so on the suggestion of my friends, what I opted to do was actually construct a slightly new paddock. Number one, instead of doing just a single strand like I did on day one, I did two strands, so it was much harder to push through without getting shocked. And according to everybody, if a cow gets shocked, it backs right up, unlike other animals like a goat, which can be a little bit more, uh, I don't know, strong-willed. But then the other thing I actually did was I put this like second ribbon fence outside of it as like a perimeter. The ribbon isn't meant to contain the animals, but again, it's supposed to be a visual cue to let them know they need to watch out. The other thing I was planning on doing was attaching some aluminum soda cans 
to the top poly wire. What that does is those aluminum soda cans attract the cattle visually and they try to lick it. And then they get a really good strong shock and that trains them to the fence as well. But before I could do that part, I had to get the cattle back into this paddock. Now the paddock that I set up was this half acre-ish or so area that I have here. Plus, it, it was like an alleyway that spanned about 800 feet all the way to the back top of the permaculture orchard. Because it seemed like the cattle were much more comfortable further away from the farmstead area, like around here, and they much preferred to be up at the top of the pasture where it looked like they could even maybe potentially try to sneak out and go to the open pasture, I figured what I would do is drive them along that top fence, try to push them in, funnel them in, close up my new perimeter fence and let them stay locked in there. And so I set to work. And unlike say an old fashioned farmer, I was using a couple modern tools to help me. Number one, I had my Polaris Ranger, which helps me get around the farm much quicker. But then number two, I had my drone. And so what I liked about my drone was actually two things. Number one, it would let me get a different type of perspective. But then number two, I found that I could actually drive and herd the cattle with the drone to a certain extent. Now it wasn't nearly as effective as me pushing them or the Polaris Ranger pushing them, but I could definitely encourage them to go in a direction just by using the remote on the drone. You know, I hope my mother is watching this video because I just gotta say, Ma, all those years of me playing video games, seems like it's finally helping me do something in the real world. Come on, let's go. Come on, come on, let's go. Let's go, let's go, come on. Come on, cattle, let's go. Come on, cows. Keep moving, keep moving, cows. Come on, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as I would slowly go with the ATV on one alleyway and the drone on another alleyway, I kept trying to cheat the cattle into the new area. It was kind of a similar process to the one that I tried the day before, but only slightly more aggressive. But unfortunately, I think my cows have gotten wise and they knew what was up. And as soon as they saw the red tape of this perimeter fence, they kind of got spooked and wouldn't go back in. And so I tried for a good half hour or 45 minutes to get them back in, but I couldn't. Now with each pass of trying to drive the cattle in, what would happen is they'd get close, but then they'd see the gate, they'd get spooked, and then they cut over to another alley. The design of my permaculture orchard was one that I did, I don't know, four and a half, five years ago, thinking about how best to raise trees and how to basically raise animals in between those trees. But I never really thought about the need to have mobility if you're chasing an animal from one alley to another. And it's really hard to drive the ATV over the alleyways. And so each time the cattle would get spooked and they'd make a right hand turn, I'd lose them and I'd have to reset and re-rack them in the back corner of the pasture. And while that was frustrating for me, it was actually terrifying for my cattle. You know, one of the, the writers I have spent a lot of time reading lately and paying very close attention to as I got ready to bring the cattle onto the farm is Temple Grandin. You know, Temple Grandin is known for a lot of things, but she really first made her name as somebody who developed processes and procedures for the meat processing business. And she writes and talks a lot about taking the animal's perspective to understand how better to take care of them. You know, some of her designs and inventions have included improved, more humane squeeze chutes for moving animals, as well as she's written a bunch of books about how to handle animals. And as I was out there on the ATV with the drone and thinking about these cattle who had just been ripped apart from their family and brought to a new farm that they completely didn't recognize, and now they've got this guy who's chasing them on a vehicle and there's this other crazy flying thing chasing them, and there's this big white dog that kind of looks like a wolf and might want to eat them. If I put myself in their shoes, no wonder they're terrified and no wonder I'm having such a hard time moving them and working with them. And so it was at that moment that I decided, you know what, I'm just gonna stop 
I'm just gonna let them do their thing. They're inside this perimeter fence, so it's not like they're in an unsafe situation. They will be absolutely fine. The bigger risk I have are my trees, but if a couple trees get killed or a couple trees get damaged, so be it. This is actually the time of year where they can take a cow eating their leaves the best because they've really all gone dormant at this point and they're losing their leaves as we speak. And, you know, and there's probably about 700 of them out there right now. And so if a couple die, a couple die. This is a situation of my making. And so if this is a penalty I have to pay, so be it. You know, when I started this farm, my vision has always been to have a place that's good for the animals that live here. Yes, we're raising animals for meat, and yes, they will ultimately have that one bad day, but their lives should be as stress-free and happy as possible. And the thing I was recognizing is my current predicament was pushing me to abandon my values. And if you don't have your values, what the hell do you have? Now you might be asking yourself at this point in the video, where the heck are my cattle? And to be honest, I don't exactly know where they are, I'm certain they're out there somewhere, probably up along the top row there. It's usually their favorite spot. Actually, a lot of times over where those trees are, right where you see my finger, that's like their favorite place to hang out. They like the shade of the trees. It kind of gives them some protection and a little privacy. So my guess is that they're probably right back out there. I gotta wait for this fog to clear and I'll be able to spot them pretty easily. So yes, I don't actually know where my cattle are. I just directionally know where they are right now. But my plan for today is that as this fog starts to clear, I'm gonna go out there with a bunch of these apples and look for my cattle and try to start earning their trust and respect the way I should have done from the beginning. It's not gonna be easy and at times I know I'm gonna look foolish. And it even could take a month or two to really earn their respect. But I'm very committed to doing this for the long haul here. And learning these types of lessons is one of my favorite parts about farming. I know that there's gonna be folks watching this video who think I've absolutely lost my mind and think that this is completely crazy. But my farm has never been going down the traditional farm path. And every time you take a step down that different path, it's gonna look weird and strange to others. And you've gotta be okay with that. And so I'm pretty okay with it myself. I hope you guys tune in next time to see where this all goes. Thanks for watching.